It's nice to think you give somebody a little chuckle at the beginning of their day, and you know, there's some value in that, I guess. Um, anyway, so the blog itself is basically a joke that got out of control and started sn snowballing, and I couldn't stop it. That's really kind of what happened. So basically, the backstory is I'm, I'm a print journalist. I've been one for 25 years. You know, I've got gray hair. I'm an older guy, right? And um, my markets, or the, the, my industry is being disrupted. And as a business writer, it's like, we're like the most clueless people in the world in some ways, like business journalists, because we have like five stories we tell over and over. And we've never had a job. We've never worked in a company. We've never made anything or sold anything. You know, we've maybe run a lemonade stand when we were kids, but we're all liberal arts majors. We don't know anything. And yet we get to like, you know, pontificate and tell big companies what they should do and meet CEOs and criticize them, right? So, um, and it's like how clueless I am that I'm writing these stories about, you know, sons getting disrupted by Linux. By the way. And I finally like clued in, like, wait a minute, like, where I work is getting disrupted by the internet. Like, oh God, you know, and I have to get over that. So um, I thought I'd better learn about blogging and I better learn about the internet. I tried to get a job at Forbes.com and they didn't want the old print guys coming over to the dot com site because they're like, they're two different worlds. They're really, really divided houses. They're actually in two different buildings, two different staffs, and they hate each other. Um, <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that. I'm supposed to say that we all work together to achieve synergy. But in fact, you know, they hate each other, right? And, um, and you know, the print guys think the dot-com guys are idiots and losers who don't make any money. And the dot-com guys think the print guys are overpaid, old, stupid idiots who don't know anything about the internet. So it's just bad, right? Um, so they wouldn't take me. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll start a blog. So I started a WordPress blog, and I did, you know, under my own name. And I had my little stuff there, and nobody read it. And then I had uh, a family blog on TypePad that was like pictures of our kids. We have, my wife and I have two-year-old twins. So I had a little blog written in the voice of my then one-year-old son, like with photos, and like he's a real menace, you know? So it was like, it was really funny stuff, like what he did today to torment his father and stuff like that. And, but it was only for family members. It had a password. And then on Blogger, I thought, well, I've got to learn how to use Blogger, and that's this big software. And, and I had written about Blogger and Google, so I thought, okay. Uh, but I didn't know what to write. And I thought, it was right about the time, too, that um, well, there were two things that came together. One is I was thinking, okay, it's a diary. And I don't know if any of you know this uh, British humor magazine called Private Eye, but they have, if you ever read it, they, I used to subscribe to it. It's really, really good. And they always have the secret diary of some famous person like David Bowie or something, some preposterous person. And they always like, in the form of that person's diary, kind of take the piss out of that person. And I thought, well, that would be funny. And then who would you do? And at the same time, it was when Scoble's book came out and all these CEO, there were all these stories about should your CEO be blogging and should he not and blah, blah, blah. And then some CEOs were doing it and supposedly it was all open and honest, but it was really just bullshit, right? It was complete, you know, hoo-ha and PR spin. But I had this idea, like, if a CEO, CEO did do a blog, but he went nuts and he like, went off the rails and just, like, <laughs> you know, like, started writing, like, what he really thought about stuff, right? And... Um, so then I, right, so it was like, it could be funny, right? So I thought, okay, that'd be cool. And then who would you do that to? And I tried Sergey Brin, but I didn't know enough about him, right? And, and you, know, they, they, you know, my wife speaks Russian, and um, so I could get a little bit of, and we have a lot of Russian friends, so I could get a little bit of Russian, but it just didn't work. And I tried a few others, and then I thought, like, I'm a big Mac fan, I, and OS X kind of changed my life, and I was, uh, 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 oh, I know that's sad, isn't it? But I mean, it's true. Um, it really is. Like, I, I, and, and I thought, oh, jobs, you know? And I didn't, I didn't cover Apple. I'd never been to Apple. I've never interviewed any of those guys. I've never, in like 20 years of tech journalism, I've never written an Apple story ever. I hadn't read any of the bios or anything about them. But I knew from being in the industry certain, you know, a little bit of stereotype about jobs and the whole, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, okay, I'll start riffing on that. So I wrote some jokes and I sent them out to, I sent links to two friends of mine. And I said, I just found this blog. And I didn't say I wrote it. And I said, it looks pretty funny, right? And um, so, and one of those friends has a blog. And he's in, he works in tech. He's, he's in a big PC maker. So he mentioned it on his blog, like, oh, I just found this funny blog. And it started spreading. And next thing you know, like, this is not news to you. Like, this is news at Cody's bookstore in Berkeley. But to you guys, I'm sure this is not news. But it was news to me. Like, you know, it starts, I start getting comments. And I'm like, where are they coming from? Who are they, how do they even know it's there, right? And people start finding it. And I did it for six weeks, and I said, okay, that was fine. I shut it down. Like, I know how Blogger works now. And somebody put it back up. Somebody relaunched the Blogger, because I, I took it all down. I just erased everything. And somebody put it up and saying, what happened to this blog? This was really good. You know, who are you? Blah, blah, blah. And people started commenting. Then some other guy started writing, revi pretending he was me, writing it. He, he was writing his fake Steve blog. <laughs> Only it sucked, right? And it kind of pissed me off. It was like, this is really lame, you know? And, 
and, and even people reading it going, dude, this sucks. This is not the same guy. And like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So then I said, okay, I'll do it again. I'll start up again. So I, I created a new URL because he already had the old URL. So I started fake Steve. Dot blogspot. And I also thought if you call it fake something or other, you, you probably it'd be harder to sue me, right? Because you know it's fake. It's pretty obviously parody. You know nobody <laughs> nobody's really going to believe this. Although people still did. People would write in comments to a blog called fakesteve.blogspot.com, like, "Dear Mr. Jobs, I'm a big fan of your products, and I'm really glad that you're blogging." And then they would ask me for like, "Could you put this feature in the next version of the MacBook Pro?" And I'd write back saying like, "Well, I'll pass your request on to engineering. It sounds good to me, but..." <laughs> You know, I'm only one man, and you know, even though I run the company, I don't make all the decisions here, but I'll, I'll tell engineering, we'll see what we can do, and we're working on that battery life issue, you know. So, and then other people would comment like, dude, you don't really think that's Steve Jobs, right? So it was, it was, I was having fun with it anyway. And um, so I put it back up, and um, then it started, it really started growing. And then, like, little things, would, like the New York Times, I think, did a story about CEO bloggers that summer, and they mentioned John Schwartz's blog, and then they said, fans of Apple CEO Steve Jobs will have to make do with an impersonator, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, so my traffic started going up, and then it was like, you know, then it was like, oh, crap, like, this is getting out of hand, right? And um, it grew, and it grew, and I started experimenting with the form, and, and again, like, as a print guy, like, delving into this new medium, it was really interesting to me, all the things you could do with it. So, uh, at first, I was just doing jokes about like Steve Jobs. I found a picture of a guy in gravity boots on Google Images, right, hanging upside down. And I said, oh, this is me. I had a meeting with John Ive today, and we talked about our new designs upside down. It's so great. Like stupid stuff, right? But then I started realizing like, things would happen. Like things would happen in the industry that I couldn't cover in Forbes because we have such a huge lead time. Like we're working on the late December edition now. So breaking news just doesn't fly for us. And even Forbes.com, I've got to go through all these people and pitch it and editors, and they go, no, we don't like it, blah, 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 you know, and <laughs> it's too opinionated. So I was like, wow, suddenly I have this outlet, and I could cover news, only I could do it through the voice of Steve Jobs, which is really <laughs> twisted, right? And way, more, and way more interesting than, like, what I would have to say about it, right? I mean, because you could say, I, wonder, I really would wonder, like, what does Steve really think about Vista, you know? And, like, you can kind of guess, right? So... Um, <laughs> It's not that hard to make up. Like, I've always people, lately I've had people out here going, like, I, some Apple boot people came to this thing Thursday, and they're like, okay, who's your source? We want to know. It's like, dude, you really think I have a source? Like, <laughs> like, I'm making this shit up, right? Like, I don't have any idea, right? Like, I don't have any sources, right? But, um, but they really think, like, someone's in the house, you know? Um, which makes me, I uh, kind of get a kick out of that. I like the idea that they may be tapping phones, because I would think that's hilarious. But... Um, so I started covering news with this. And then it's, people started reading it and getting like, some value from it, which was really weird. And then the other thing you could do with it is you could do fiction with this blog form, which, again, is not news to you, but was news to me, that um, you know, I wrote two books of fiction before I went to work at Forbes. And I really wanted to be a novelist. And I took the job at Forbes just because like, you know, writing novels wasn't paying the bills and blah, blah, blah. But I still was trying to write novels. And so anyway, like Larry Ellison and Bono and Al Gore, it all became characters to me, like in this world. And you could create them and develop them and add to them and, and have a backstory for them. And, and you could have little storylines where something happens on Tuesday and then on Thursday and then on Saturday. So I could have, you know, Al Gore's wife kicked him out and he, she, he moved in with us and he's going to stay for a week. And like, you know, now he won't leave, you know. And like a few days later, he's like, <laughs> Al's eating meat and he's leaving, you know, food wrappers around the house and my wife's going to kill me and she wants him out. And, and how do we get rid of him, you know. So you could do these like little like comic strip kind of storylines, like a serial comic strip, you know? And that part was like so fun. Like I have to tell you, it's like, well, so much more fun than covering tech at Forbes, right? Like covering IBM, you know, you know like, right? So um, like really, really fun, like addictively fun. And I just couldn't stop. And I was just, you know, could not stop. And um, I couldn't make money either, but I couldn't stop, right? So, um, and that, that finally started to become an issue at home with my wife and the little kids and, you know, crazy dad off in his office blogging, right? So, um, like, you know, right? so um, I, I finally thought, well, you know, I'll try Google AdSense. <laughs> that, that, you make a lot of money on that, as I'm sure you know. That is a real profit maker for bloggers. Really wonderful program, and I want to thank you all for that. Thank you so much. Really, really great. I've made a fortune on those little AdSense ads, man. People click on them. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Great job. Um, so that didn't work out. And, uh, and uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to find someone to, you know, sell ads. But then I, I realized I'd boxed myself into a corner in a little bit because 
if you're doing an anonymous blog, it's kind of hard to sell ads, right? Like, you know, like, hello, I'm using my voice to AJ. Would you like to buy an ad? Like, people don't want to deal with you, right? So, and then a lot of companies didn't want to deal with it. And it just was, there's no way around it. So I realized at some point, though, that what I was doing was kind of creating the material of a book without knowing it. Like, I, all the time that I should have been working on this book that I had put aside to do this stupid blog, I realized, like, oh, this kind of is becoming a book, a very silly book and, you know, a very kind of stupid book, but like a book nonetheless, right? And it was sort of a novel. Like, this whole world existed. There were characters. So I wrote a book proposal in um, Christmas, over Christmas break, and in January I sold it. And I think a lot of, and I was able to say I had 90,000 uniques a month on uh, a blogger, so I could say, you know, I have a kind of an audience. So I took this proposal saying, you know, and it turns out book, propose, book publishers weren't so psyched about blog-to-book conversions. They haven't done very well, a lot of them. They haven't been big sellers. So it was not a big benefit. Anyway, some a press took it, and a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of publishers were afraid of Apple, and they didn't want to take it. Or they're still hoping to get Steve Jobs' biography, and they didn't want to piss him off. Seriously, it was a real thing. Like, they said, you know, we don't want to piss off Steve Jobs. And I was like, yeah, neither do I, but, you know, <laughs> whatever. It's too late now, right? You know, like, I'm screwed, right? I'm in for a penny, in for a pound, right? You know, so... <clears throat> um, so the little press took it, and fine. And then I, then I realized, you know, okay, I've got this book deal. And then I had to write it, you know, which is another bad, like, moment where you realize, oh, shit, like, you know, <laughs> I can't just put the blog between two covers. So I actually didn't write, I didn't do it. The book is actually a whole different thing. I mean, there's a little bits of pieces of the blog, like stuff that I liked that was on the blog or that could somehow fit into a narrative. But the story of the book is, what I made up is that, okay, the SEC is after Steve Jobs. And in my mind, Jobs is this, you know, invincible man god, son of Zeus, born to mortal woman, you know, this all-powerful, you know, can, can change the weather and stuff. And, um, <clears throat> But he finally finds himself in a situation where he can't control it and he can't stop it. The SEC is after him. The feds are after him. He thinks it's bullshit, but there's nothing he can do. So I thought I'll exaggerate that for effect and comic effect and how do we get out of trouble. So that's sort of the plot of that. You know, you could build a plot around that. And then at the same time, he's trying to finish the iPhone. So the story of the book is the six months in Steve's life from when he, the last six months before the January announcement, it ends with the January announcement of the iPhone. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the, the ending because there is a little trick ending. <clears throat> but, um, but that's basically the story. So even if you read the blog, uh, you'll recognize the voice and the world and the characters. But, like, for example, a lot of people say to me, how come Beastmaster isn't in the book? Because Bill Gates really isn't in the book except in one dream sequence. <laughs> but um, <laughs> where, where, where uh, Job says he, he, wake, he, he has this recurring dream where he, which he's going up to get the Nobel Prize, right? And as he's going up there, the Peace Prize. And... But this time the dream gets interrupted and he's carrying a cross and he's walking up the hill and then he's up on a crucifix and, and next to him is Bill Gates and, and he looks at Gates and says, I understand why you're here, but why am I here, you know? And, um, and Gates says, you know, you're here because you spent 30 years copying all my ideas and then he says, I wake screaming, you know, that's like, so, um, but that's the only appearance of Gates in the book. So, so um, you know, it's a very, very different story. It's really focused on this SEC thing. Um, okay, so part two of the story is that's how the blog became a book and how it evolved. Part two is, you know, what happened at Forbes, right? So they didn't know I was doing this. And, and I didn't tell anyone for a long time. And, um, and one of the first people who spotted the blog and started writing about it was Rich Cargard, who's the publisher of Forbes. And he started posting things saying, Silicon Valley's in an uproar about this weird new blog about Steve Jobs and nobody knows who it is. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, you know, he's like, <laughs> like, like he's my boss, right? He's my boss's boss's boss, right? And, and I know him, you know, and, and so... I thought, what do I do? Do I tell him? And I was like, nah, I'm not going to tell him. So um, <laughs> then he kept posting. And then he and Quentin Hardy, our bureau chief out here, started having like little contests about who they thought it was. And maybe it's this guy. Maybe it's that guy. Then they offered a reward. So I'm like, oh, my God. You know, like, like, and it was like a high-end iPod, which I still don't think they've actually given to Brad Stone but, um, of the New York Times. So I thought, I let it go for a while. And it was getting more and more out of hand. And when I sold the book, I thought, I called this lawyer. And I hired her for one hour. All right. I said, can I hire you for one hour so that you'll, we have attorney-client privilege and you can't tell anybody who I am? But I was really bad at keeping the secret anyway. But anyway, so she said, okay. And I told her, okay, so here's the deal. I'm writing this blog. I work at Forbes. She was like, are you out of your mind? Like, she's in publishing, right? But she's like, you have to shut it down right away. Like, that's really bad. You're going to get fired. Your, your career, you know, you can't do this. So I posted a thing, and she said, just try to back out of it easy, you know. You know just fold it, fold it down and let it go. 
So I posted a thing in Jobs' voice saying, well, you know, because of this SEC thing, the old Apple lawyers have told me I've got to shut this crazy blog down because I can't be making fun of the feds while they're trying to put me in jail. It's only going to make things worse. I can't keep taunting them because I love doing that. I love taunting. Because don't you think that's how he probably thinks of, you know, like these sons of bitches, you know? But um, so I, I love doing like, if, like if, anyway, it's a nutty idea, but, you know. Um, so I wrote this thing, and I thought, okay, I'll kind of fade it out. And instead what happened is everybody read it thinking that Apple was after some blogger again, like they had already sued those other bloggers. So suddenly all these media people start call- emailing me like, is it true, Apple's after you? Then they're calling Apple com- for comment, right? And, Apple's- and Apple, of course, says no comment, which so makes them think it's true, right? So they're like, they're like, oh my God, Apple's suing another blogger. They're trying to find out who it is. They, you know, they- I think they call Google to find out, has Apple made any attempts to find out who it is through blogger? Have they sent it for you to do, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh my God, right? And then in my site media, it's like, woo, like, like crazy, crazy, like big, big day. And then, so I was kind of half happy, half, you know, half scared shitless, right? But um, so, and I was in New York when this happened, and I was in New York asking my boss on the print side if I could, like, get a little bit better job and, you know, like, maybe have a column, get a little, you know, raise, you know? And they were saying, no, 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 go away, you loser, right? So, so I go back to my hotel in New York, and I got all this mail on the fake Steve account, and... Uh, it's like from, you know, Wired, we'd like to do something with you, we don't know who you are, but we love, well, Wired loved it, right? And uh, a few other magazines asked me, do I want to be a columnist? And then in the mail, and I swear to God this is true, there's an email from Rich Cargard of Forbes magazine, and I open it up, he's like, dear fake Steve, you know, my name is Rich Cargard, I'm the publisher of Forbes magazine, we think you're a genius, and we want you to come work at Forbes and write a big column for us on the website, right? And I'm like, I'm like, yes, right? Like, so I'm like, you know, this is awesome, right? So like, like you know, they can't fire me now, right? Because I'm going to save this email, right? Like, you're fucked now, right? So I got you by the balls, right? And, um, and I, so, but I was also kind of scared, right? So, and, and I didn't know what to do, so I waited and I wrote back and I was like, well, how much would you pay me, right? And he's like, he's like, well, we'll talk about money later, blah, 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 yada, 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 right? So I'm like, great, this is great. So we had this long correspondence with Rich. And meanwhile, like, I had just been in L.A. at this Forbes conference, like, sitting, having dinner with him, like, like hey, who's that fake Steve guy? <laughs> you know? Like, so, fine. He's, um... He now wants to hire me, right? I'm like, this is great. This is so great. Like, because Forbes.com wouldn't hire me, right? And, and I, it's like so twisted. I can't even believe it, right? And, um, and then I get mail a few, like a week later from, you know, Forbes is a part owned by Elevation Partners, this private equity firm out here in, in the Valley. So one of their guys writes to me and says, dear fake Steve, I'm at a private equity firm, blah, blah, like I'm, yeah, I have all this money, I'm a VC guy, and we think we could invest in your blog and make a business around it. And I'm like, cha-ching, right? Like, <laughs> like, you know, there's like so much stupid money out here, and I'm like, yes, I'm capping into it, yay, right? You know, like, like you know, Facebook too, that's me, you know, like, all right. I don't have a product, I have an revenues, who cares, you know, just, I got VC. So um, I thought like, I'm going to be so rich, this is great. And um, so I had my agent, my book agent, because, you know, trust me, I wasn't getting rich on the book, you know. Just, you know. So the book agent uh, contacted the Elevation guy and went back and forth, and we finally were going to set up a meeting, and I thought, okay, now I finally have to tell them. Like, I can't keep, you know, pulling their leg. So I did. I, took, I called Rich Cargard, and I called the Elevation guy. And the response was, like, swear. It was, like, I, it was on the phone, but I swear this is, like, the look was, like, oh. I'm like, Yeah. All right, it's you, huh? Like, no, right? They were, like, so hoping it was somebody cool or, you know, hip or inside Apple. And they were like, oh, it's just this putz in Boston, right? This schmuck on our staff. But then, then I think it occurred to him, like, oh, shit, we don't have to pay him. Like, we already have him, right? Like, great, you know? Woo, bargain of the century, you know? So um, <laughs> um, I was on a panel last, a couple weeks ago at this conference, and someone said, if I, uh, someone from a news organization said, we have writers who want to blog, what's the first thing we should say to them? And this guy said, you should say to them, we're not paying you. So that's, um, that was the, the basic ethos. But, um, so we started working on a deal where they, they actually wanted to put it on Forbes, or put something else on Forbes, like maybe not fake Steve, but more like a, you know, the Stanley Bin column in Fortune, where it's that, that back page of Fortune, but it's kind of boring, and it's kind of like, you know, it's not that interesting. So they thought we could do like an edgy online version of Bing, we'll make up a character and riff on the news of the day. Okay, fine. Um, but, uh, and it just took months and months and months of like that going back and forth and churning and all this bullshit, right? But finally, we were just, we were just getting it together and the New York Times figured it out. And, and the way they, they figured it out, even though Valleywag was trying over and over, and by then there were like 100 people who knew, like everybody at Forbes knew for like months, right? Not everybody, but a lot of people. And a lot of my friends knew, and they were telling everybody. And Valleywag kept guessing the wrong guy, like over and over and over again. I was like so amazed, like Valleywag would just guess wrong. Um, 
And the Brad, the Brad Stone at the Times got it because he, he used to work at Random House, and he realized if you've sold a book, that you probably shopped it. And a lot of people looked at the proposal. And he called Random House, and they had a proposal. And it didn't have my name on it, but it had enough information about me that I worked at a business magazine, blah, blah, blah. I had some stuff about it. I, I was on some list that Granted did for novelists in the 90s. And so even without my name, you could, you could cross that and figure out who it was. So it was like three days, and Brad Stone had it. Um, and then Forbes had to rush to kind of uh, you know, try to jump on the grenade and you know, uh, put their stuff up on the blog. So, so now I have this deal where it's become, it's not on the Forbes site, but they have their ads and their brand on my blogger site. And, um, and they totally leave it alone. They don't, they don't want anything to do with it. And I think, I think the way they're looking at it is like, I think the first generation of, of web media was, let's just take what we do in print and put it on a website. And, or take what we do on TV and put it on a website and sell ads. And, and they're kind of realizing like, okay, that's, that's something. But that there's a new medium gives opportunities to do new things. And, this probably, you know, who knows if it'll work. But, you know, I think they're smart enough to try to, like, throw a bunch of stuff out there and see if it works. And if it doesn't, who cares? So it's kind of interesting to me that this old media company, like a 90-year-old company, was really the one that ended up, because uh, there were other people interested, but Forbes was more interested uh, in, um, in trying to stretch and, and, and expand it and, and see what happens and, and take some risk with it. And, you know, if, if there's problems, we'll deal with it. But that's, that's kind of where it is. And for me, it's kind of cool because... Like, I got to meet all these people that, on this internet world that I never knew before, like Veronica Belmont, my, my big web crush. She came to this thing Friday. And I, I really think it's a really exciting time in media that there's all these young kids who are doing stuff that's really, really fun and interesting and exciting. And I get to meet them now when they're young and, you know, you know they're going to build big things. So um, for me, it's been really fun to be able to become a part of that in a little bit and, um, and, and have some fun in, in the time. So that's, that's about all I have to say. And I can just take some questions if you, if you have them. But... Um, yeah, sorry. So, have you ever met the real Steve? No. So, would it ruin it for you? I think it would ruin it for him more than for me, but... Uh, <laughs> mm, I haven't, and I would, I would love... So, the question is, have I ever met the real Steve, and would it ruin it for me? And, and I would love... No, I would sort of love... I, I would love to in a way, but I, as long as I knew it wasn't going to kill me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, I met Wozniak Thursday night. They brought Woz in to do some event, and... Uh, I was pretty worried because, like, you know, I do a lot of nasty riffs on Waz, right? Like, uh, and he was totally cool. He said, and then, but then I thought, like, he's dating Kathy Griffin. He must have a sense of humor, right? And, <laughs> and like, and a pretty mean sense of humor, right? And I asked him that, and he said, well, I don't really like her sense of humor, but you know, I like yours better. But he, he, he didn't care. He was cool. He was very cool. I have a picture of him. I, I gave him a T-shirt that says, "Dude, I invented the friggin' iPod." Have you heard of it? And I had him hold it up, like, and, and so I could take a photo of him. It's like classic. I can't. I'm gonna keep it for my whole life. And it was a really great moment meeting Waz, and I met Andy Hertzfeld. He came to this event too, but I've never met Steve, and I don't know if he likes it or not, or what he what he thinks about it. He said it all things D that he thinks it's funny. I mean, I hope he does. If if they if I really thought like, oh, he's sitting there like hating it, you know. I would feel bad about it. I want it to be kind of fun in a comedy strip. And sometimes it goes over the line and is a little too mean. And then I, I, I've actually erased some things like that. I want to keep it like fun and, and mostly in a spirit of like, like Doonesbury. You get up and maybe it has a little point once in a while, but mostly it's just in a spirit of, of having some fun and celebrating, you know, the valley and the wackiness of, of the culture here. So um, any other questions or no questions? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm phasing that out as of today. Actually, no. <laughs> yeah, that's a bad one. But, you know, people send you in these ideas and, you know, you go with it. But anyway, yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. So, as an omelet, you have to, you know, make sure your taxes are consistent. Here's the additional problem. You have to sort of make it consistent with reality. You have to take the square, you know, someone do something, or you learn something more about a character and you have to change it. Yeah, so the question, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. The question is, as a novelist, you have to be consistent, you have to, you have to stick with your characters, and have there ever been issues where I felt like I had to match it? I have the added challenge of having to match it to real people, right? To some extent, early on, I decided that I wouldn't be bound by that, and I would just make them characters. So Larry Ellison, I have no idea what Larry Ellison's like, but, you know, we've all heard the stories, right? So, um, and I just go with that, and, and I've totally made him up, like, and exaggerated him. And to me, he's like a character in a Woody Allen movie. He has no bearing on reality, and um, you know what I mean? Like, like... Um, I can't remember if it's Manhattan or one of, the, one of the ones where 
Woody Allen has this friend who's always calling him Max, even though his name isn't Max, and he's like in L.A. and he's a screenwriter, and that's what I think of as Larry Ellison, like the sidekick friend who's kind of the bachelor wild guy. Um, but no, with, but the readers are very quick to call you on, like, I'll do something, I did something once on EMC, just because there was a funny story about EMC in the Wall Street Journal one day, and I just couldn't resist, and I know those EMC guys. And I realized, like, Steve Jobs probably never thinks about EMC. That's probably the last company on earth he cares about. But I did it anyway. And then you get all the things saying, dude, get back to writing about Steve. This isn't Steve, you know. So I think what's kind of happened is this, this weird character has evolved in the middle where there's, there's real Steve and then there's me, you know, very, very different people. And then there's um, this fake Steve who's become this, like, weird little demon character who's in the middle, right, who, who can take liberties that real Steve can and isn't really like Steve Jobs but has, has things like him. And it's like... I, I sometimes compare it to, like, Triumph the Insult Dog. Um, you know, that, that, that puppet dog? I met this guy at Comedy Central who said, if you met Robert Smigel, who does that puppet, he said, Smigel is like a really, really gentle, soft-spoken, sweetest guy you ever met in your life, Talk like, not very funny. And then you put a dog puppet on his hand, right? And he becomes like, ah, like crazy, right? And he's really funny. And it's, for me, it's like that. Like, I, you know, my life is not that exciting or interesting or anything. And then, you know, fake Steve has become this voice that you can channel. And it's, really, it's, it's kind of fun. But uh, I don't think it has too much bearing on real Steve, you know. Any other questions? Or, yeah. So, uh, what's next after the book? <laughs> Back to Forbes, right? Like, like, sorry. <laughs> Back to writing about IBM and, like, the future of the mainframe. And, you know, like, yeah, so <laughs> I can't wait to do that. You know, the mainframe remains relevant because it runs Linux. Yeah, great. Or, you know, I don't know, man. Like, I'm dreading what comes next, dude. Trust me. I'm like, you know, or, you know, son, will that chip save them? You know, like, yeah, sure it will. Um, <laughs> uh, you know. You know, Novell, can they take on Microsoft? No! You know, like, you know, I also, I love those stories in the mainstream media. In fact, I have more fun in the blog, like, making fun of other reporters and making fun of the news than I do of, like, Apple sometimes. Like, because I love those stories that have this, like, teaser headline that's like, will so-and-so do this and that? And, like, you know, like, no, of course not. And then, but they make you wait to the end and they're like, you know, like well, basically now, you know. You know? And, like, and we do those. We're very, very guilty of those. We do those at Forbes. I mean, and I, I sort of know why magazines and newspapers do it. But, um, but yeah, I've had so much fun like, making fun of reporters. <laughs> and, um, and it's sort of like this self-loathing. Because if you're a business journalist, you, know, you can't help but help hate yourself, right? Because what you do is, in a way, so gross and terrible. And, um, <laughs> and, and, well, and it's also so dishonest. that like, if, you met, if you hung out with the Valley Press Corps, right? When, if you read what they write... And then if you hung out with them, it's very, very different what they talk about among themselves, which I also think is something I found very, very interesting. This isn't really a joke, but something really interesting about blogging to me was that in a really weird, profound way, I could tell the truth on this blog in a way I could never do in Forbes. Not only Forbes.com, which is a little loosey-goosey, but definitely in print. And I know that sounds like I'm saying that we lie in print, and it's, it isn't that. And I can't quite get my head around how to explain it, but there's a way that you can say, tell the truth and even now that I'm out, it wasn't like because I was anonymous. The anonymity was nice because it, you could keep up the suspension of disbelief. But like you can just say stuff that's true uh, in a way that you can't. Like you can sort of dissect a news story and find out like why, like why yesterday Andy Rubin was in the New York Times talking about this new phone from Google. I don't know. How did that happen? Wow. You know? I mean, you know, this shit doesn't happen by accident, right? And... Um, or, or why, you know, Carl, you know, suddenly in the journal there's this big story about why, how Motorola is all screwed up and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then way down at the end you see, Carl Icahn says he's very upset. Right? He's trying to get rid of Xander, right? So he planted the story of the journal. Um, and that's the kind of dishonesty that I think is really, really funny to make fun of in the press. Like, the journal doesn't tell you, here's how we made this story. You don't see how the sausage is made. Like, Carl Icahn and his people came to us, and they're trying to get rid of Ed Xander. So they wanted us to do this story. So they lined up some stuff and fed us some crap about how fucked up Motorola is so we'd write it. And then we'd have to cover his ass by giving him a quote at the end that makes him look like he's just hearing this for the first time, right? I mean, that's what really the story is, right? So, um, I mean, that's how it happened. That's what, the story, that's what that really story was. And, and it was really fun to be able to say, after you read that story, like, yeah, dude, okay, let me explain. What, or, you know. Um, so, I don't know how I got off on that long tirade. I'm really sorry. Um, uh, yeah, it's just a question. So what's, the, what's the future of business journalism? Well, yeah, I, What's the future of business journalism is, is the story. I think, it, I think what's happening, it, people, we tend to, and, and business journalists are most guilty of this, we tend to view everything as zero sum. So, like, there's the blog, so mainstream media is dead, you know? And I don't think it's that. I think, you know, I don't want to wake up and find out that, uh, pick up the journal or the New York Times or the Washington Post and have it read, like, Daily Kos, right? Or, like, Fake Steve. You know, I don't. I like having a paper that is, does real journalism. 
I just think there's room for more and there's room for a bigger pie. So I think business journalism is, is probably going to change and have more attitude, more, more humor. Like, that's the other thing. Most business journalism is so boring. I mean, it's so terribly boring. And it's like the worst part of every newspaper is the business section. Oh, the bite section. Is the bite section on the New York Times a movement in that way? I, yeah, I guess. A little, it's more you know, lively and, 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 and interactive. But the great thing about online is I think what's going to happen is there's more interactivity. And what I've realized with this blog, and again, this is not news to you, but it was to me, is that um, you don't really have an audience with a blog. You have this community. Like All these people come to these. I went to Toronto, and 30 people showed up who read the blog. They post comments, and they, they want to meet each other and me, and they want to talk about the stuff on this blog. But they're very much driving the blog now. I get so much mail every day with all the ideas that just bubble up through the mail, um, and I, I, I can't even sift through it all. But yeah, I think that's going to happen. I think business journalism is going to become more lively, more fun, more interactive, better in, in many, many ways, and bigger. You know, I think all of it can become bigger rather than just one thing substituted out for the other. And the journal is probably going to get very different under Murdoch, you know, but uh, I don't know for better or for worse. But, um, that's, yeah. Any, any other questions? Or, yes? How many hours per day do you spend? Yeah, it varies. Too many, a lot of days. Like this week, not much at all because I'm traveling and doing stuff. And, and sometimes when I'm traveling, I'll get someone to try to cover for me, at least moderate comments. But if I'm home, like, it, and it just, it varies. Like around the time of the iPhone, it was like basically all I was doing. And a lot of hours. And the stuff was flooding in and the reviews were flooding in. So you just couldn't keep up with it. And I was trying to surf on top of that iPhone stuff. Um, but some days I won't do anything at all. Yesterday I wrote one thing in the morning, and it was like, you know, and I write them really, really fast. I don't labor over them, and, and they they're often have typos and mistakes in them, and um, I go back and try to fix those, but I, I just bang them out as fast as I can. As soon as I think of them, I don't write them in Word and then upload them. I write them live in Blogger and just, bam, pop them out, and I grab some photo off of Google Images, you know, and, and, um, <clears throat> yeah, um, and, um, and try to put those two together. Um, Oh, and I just thought of, oh, no, I was going to say that the one funny thing I've, I've learned about the internet and the thing I love so much is, is and as a reporter, I would always have these, you know, people who like to correct you. And I think the internet is so full of, like, incredible pedants and correction people. And, um, and it's amazing that the way they love to, like, seize on any little mistake, you know. So I realized early on if I put an intentional mistake in, if you made it sly enough that it looked like you just didn't know it was a mistake, um, you'd get swarmed with like corrections and it's like my favorite thing, I think it's seriously my favorite thing about the blog is being able to say, like I said something the other day that Jobs wants to run for president, he says, you know, I think I could keep running Disney and Pixar and I could be president and, you know, without breaking a sweat and I could solve global warming, I could get us out of Iraq and I could make peace with the South Koreans, right? And so, <laughs> and, and I get all this mail, like, dude, it's North Korea, I'm like, uh, oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, thank you. Or, you know, um, I had one with Portugal once where I made something, some stupid thing about Lisbon and Portugal. And it's better when, like, people who don't read the blog somehow get sent a link about it. So I said, you know, in Portugal, somebody sent me a document in Portuguese saying there's going to be a store, an Apple store finally opening in Lisbon. So I wrote it saying, um, you know, the Portugalians are very excited about this, <laughs> that, um, that they're finally going to get... I, I don't read Lebanese, but if you do... <laughs> There's, you can see that there's, a, there's an Apple store is finally going to open in Lisbon, and they're very happy because until now they've had to buy their, their Macs from neighboring countries in the Middle East. And uh, <laughs> so, and that, that was so broad, it's like nobody's going to fall for that one, right? Like, I thought, well, that's just one everybody will get, like, ha ha ha. No. I start getting comments, like, like from people in Portugal who don't know the blog, but they're really pissed, right? We're not in the Middle East, we don't speak Lebanese, you know, we're not Portugalians. And then I started getting email, too. Like, it must, I think it was like a chain letter around Portugal. People were sending this around, and I was getting bombarded with stuff, so I finally had to write. I ran one of the emails that someone sent me without their name, but I ran an email from this very nice woman explaining to me where Portugal was, and, you know, she knows I'm in America, and we don't know a lot about the world here. And, it was like, oh, this is like, just like so good, you know, like better than sex. This is so great, you know, like I can't believe it. I literally sometimes be, my wife and I at home share an office. I work out of the house, but we have an office at home. Sometimes I'll be working at night and she's working. We're back to back in this little tiny room. And I'll say, oh, I'm about to send this thing. I'll be like, you know, say la vie, as they say in Latin, right? Or, you know, <laughs> or, or I, had, I had like N Napoleon crossing the Rubicon and saying, and saying, alia yakta est, right? And, um, and I'll, I'll tell Sasha, my wife will be like, okay, I'm going to hit send. Like, let's time it. How long till some asshole writes in, right? And it's like, you know, five minutes, you know. The first correction is in, yes, you know. And then, like, then you wait a couple more minutes, and the first person making fun of the correction is in, and it's just like, woo, let it go, you know. It's just like, and 
again, if you write, you spend like, I've spent the last 10 years like sitting there writing print articles that like have to go through five editors and, you know, they get mashed and mangled and turned around and blah, 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 and it takes months. Like the ability to do this is like so much fun, right? Like you just mess with people like that. It's just unbelievably fun. Um, and now I can't believe I actually get paid for it, like, which is even more bizarre, right? Like, and, and which is very fun. I don't know if it'll last forever, but it's, um, it's, it's pretty fun for now. I'm sorry, are there questions? I keep rambling. And, uh, <laughs> yes, sorry. Oh, I read a bunch of biographies of Jobs early on. I thought if I'm going to do this, I should learn something about him. So I read some biographies. And Andy Hertzfeld's book, um, Revolution in the Valley, was a really, really good book. Um, and he, he has, and the anecdote that my novel opens with comes from Andy Hertzfeld's book where in 84, is anybody here was at Apple in, in the 80s on the Mac team? Are there any? No, but there must be people at Google. Anyway, there's a great story of they're making the Mac and Jobs comes down and he looks at the circuit board or the motherboard or something and he's like, that's way too ugly. We can't, that's no. And they're like, well, it's going to be inside. No one's going to see it as a sealed box. He's like, no, no, it's out of all the balance. The chips have to go like this. And, uh, and they're like, dude, it won't work, right? Like we're electrical engineers, right? There's a reason why. He's like, no, 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 we've got to do it. So they actually spent like months trying to like make a board that looked the way he wanted it to look, but it would never <laughs> run, right? That's in Hertzfeld's book. So I open with Jobs. He's in his Tassahara meditation room at Apple, which I don't know. And he's, um, <laughs> he's, he's gazing. He's non-thinking about a circuit board. He's just looking at it. And it's the circuit board for the iPhone. And it works. Works great. But it's not beautiful. And it has to be beautiful. And again, his engineers are saying to him, dude, you know, it's in a phone. It's locked up. You can't open it. And he's like, I don't care. I'll know it's there. So, um, <laughs> you know, so he has to like redo this board. And, and he makes him redo it. And in the end, of course, it doesn't work. Same deal. So I, I sort of riffed on Hertzfeld. He came, Hertzfeld came to the reading. Thursday, and I recognized him. He, I didn't recognize him at first, and he said, do you ever read Revolution in the Valley? I was like, dude, you're Andy Hertzfeld. And he was like, yeah. I was like, oh, we got to get a photo, right? And, they, and I said, dude, of course I read your book. It's great. He goes, yeah, I know. I've seen some of it show up on your blog. And I'm like, oh. And I said, um, but, you know, but like, yeah, so certain things I, I ripped from books and exaggerated. And, you know, like Jobs made a, a pilgrimage to India when he was like 19 and, and seeking enlightenment. So I, I have a chapter about that in my book where what really happened in India, you know? And it's... Um, <laughs> And apparently, in real life, what really happened, he went, and it was really disillusioning. Like, he thought he was going to go to India and get enlightened. Instead, he just got lice or something, you know? And, and um, like, really, it was just really a bad trip. So, um, uh, so I, I managed to, like, exaggerate that in the book, too. So there's a lot of stuff you can take from the biography and kind of riff on. Uh, are there any other questions? Or... Oh, oh, yep, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, the question is, that's a good question. The question is, how has the traffic changed on the blog since I got outed? So it's gone down, um, is the short answer, but not appreciably. I, I basically had a big June because of the iPhone, and then big July because of the iPhone, and then a huge August because of um, the outing. Like one day in August, I had uh, 500,000 visitors, right, on, on the site. And then now, and then after that came, I went back down to like pre-iPhone levels. So, you know, it's, it's okay. It's still, you know, a really, for me, a really big audience. For Forbes, it's a drop in the bucket. You know, I kind of thought I had this big, you know, I got all these readers. And they, I realized like my page views per month are like what they do in an hour on a big story, you know. So, um, but it's gone down, but it's, it's sort of holding steady. It's going to dip this month because I'm not blogging as much. I think of the, the big uh, traffic you get is out of volume. Like if you post a lot and a lot and a lot, and I'm just not able to right now. But, you know, as soon as I get home next week, I'm going to start trying to fire it up some more and, uh, get it going. But, um, and just a little AdSense anecdote. The day, the day of the outing where I had all those hits, I was driving home from Maine. I was in Maine on vacation. I promised my wife, we'll go away and we won't do any work, right? We won't do any. I promise you, honey, because I was writing this book and I haven't been around. We have two year old twins and they're crazy, right? So we get like, we didn't even get to Maine. And then I got a call that Brad Stone of the New York Times was, you know, working on the story. Like, literally had to, you know, spend a day and come back. And like, it was just a nightmare. Um, but I was on the phone with this woman from the, I think, the San Francisco Chronicle on the way down from Maine doing an interview. And I, and I got home. I said, hold on, I'm going to check my traffic. I'm going to go into the house. So I check, and I was like, holy God, like 500,000 people are on my site today. Like, this is incredible. And they said, let's see what we did on AdSense, right? And it was like $17.36. I'm like, how can this be, right? So I wrote to the Google guys, like, dude, is there some kind of fucking mistake here? How can I get 17 bucks out of this? And they're like, well, people aren't clicking on the ad. You know, you get, you get the Google boilerplate, like, who believes her? You know? I'm like, so, I mean, um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, and now, you know, I'm doing, I just still do feed burner and I get a little bit of money out of that, which is also a, a Google thing now, right? I think it is. So, so. Um, questions or any, anybody have any questions here? Or? 
is Forbes paying me better? Um, they couldn't pay me worse. No, I'm like, oh, this is on YouTube. Hello, Forbes. Um, no, what they, the deal is now they still have my job in print, and they still pay me for that. And actually, I have a different job. I'm now a columnist. Our gadget guy happened to go away about the same time this was happening. So I inherited the gadget column. So now I'll be writing about things like new smartphones that some companies make. And, um, um, and, um, and, and, and that's basically the same deal. And then on the, on the, what we did is on the dot-com side, it's just the deal that, that any of the publishers do. We'll pay you some amount, and then we'll go try to sell ads and, and recoup that by selling ads against your traffic. So yeah, so in effect, they're paying me. Well, basically, really what it is is I have two jobs now. And um, it's not really like I got a raise. I just have another job. And it happens to be with them, so it's cool, you know. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I feel I feel weird talking about money here. You know what I mean? Like it's like, you know, I've been out to Atherton. I've seen the houses. Okay, so you know, and I know, you know, and I know not all of you are billionaires, but um, or have jumbo jets, but some of you do, right? And um, which I think is great. I'm so happy about that. Like you're like the Forbes ideal. Like we just love this anyway. And. Um, and seriously, it is sick to go to, F I live in Boston, I live in Medford, if any of you know Boston, it's like, you know, you know Medford where Tufts is, and it's like really, you know, affordable, right? And um, then you come out here and you go to like dinner at someone's house in Atherton, and it's like, holy crap, like, you really have a lot of money, don't you? And they're like, yep, yeah, mm-hmm, yep, yeah. you know? Like I stayed in somebody's house, and we got there the other night, Thursday, he's like, oh, I'm gonna put you up in the, get to the house, and it's like, whoa. And then he's like, oh, I'm gonna put you up in the guest house. I was like, why, you got like 400 rooms in this house, right? So then in the morning, his wife said to me, I came in, he was gone, his wife was there, and she said, oh, is everything okay? I was like, everything okay? Like, your guest house is bigger than my house at home. Like, <laughs> it's huge, yeah, it was great, it was fine. Can I stay? I'm moving in, I'm gonna go get my clothes, you know? Like, yeah, I mean, God almighty, it's, it's, it blow, seriously, it blows my mind out here. I really, and it, probably some of you it does too. I mean, it's still, I've been covering this for 20 years and it still blows my mind every time I come out here and just see the culture here. Um, and I think it's so ripe for parody and satire, that's why I wrote the book. And, and, um, <laughs> No, I mean, it is, right? I mean, you're living it. You know it, right? You know how crazy it is. And so I have my next idea. I want to do a book about Facebook. Um, but, uh, but not really Facebook, but something like Facebook. And, you know, it's like the valuation keeps going up and up and up, and nobody can quite figure out why. But they're like, well, let's not fuck with it, you know? And like, so, um, you know, um, so I just think it's like, can you imagine being inside there now? Some of you probably will be inside there soon, right? Um, um, but from what I hear. Um, but no, I just think, like, can you imagine being in a place like that? Like, a, you know, uh, I, so I think it would be really, really ripe for a funny book. So I, I might do something like that. I, I'd like to do a, a couple more of these funny books about the valley because I also think nobody's ever plumbed that really. Nobody's ever captured the insanity of the valley. They either do these sort of hagiographical sort of books about like these wonderful CEOs or like the you know, soul of the new machine kind of books, but nobody ever just like makes fun of it, which I think is really, really um, I easy. Yeah, that's right. I said, <laughs> said easy. Yeah, like fish in a barrel, man. You know, but I mean. Um, <laughs> And like, I can't believe it's just hanging out there, you know, like, woo, you know, so um, I'll probably try to do more of that. And even if fake Steve kind of goes away, which I, I, I think eventually, I can't imagine I'll be 70 and still you know, like making Steve Jobs jokes. <laughs> like, I hope not, you know. Um, I will try to do something else li like it, you know, because it is a lot of fun. Anyway, is there, um, yes? Now you've got big company backing from Forbes, so you're going to make real fake iPhones and real... <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, now that I have uh, a big company backing me, Will I make real fake iPhones and fake iPods? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, just hand them out if you ask. That's not a bad idea, like little, little uh, paper ones or something? Could somebody at Google get on that? Could you guys, you have 20, don't you have 20% of your time free here? <laughs> right? right? All right, give me your card afterwards. We'll talk about this. And, and if, if anybody else wants to make T-shirts, because I have a shitty T-shirt shop. Like, I have like, the world's worst T-shirts. I actually have the world's worst site. Like, I was going to change it and make it nice, and then someone told me, no, dude, that's what we like. It's so ugly. You know, leave it like that. Like, it looks like crap. Yeah, you know? And, uh, and apparently that's part of the joke. I didn't realize it. It's only on Blogger because I was so, you know, such a moron. I didn't know how to do anything else. And um, then somebody told me, no, that's the joke. The joke is that, like, this big, powerful CEO would have a Blogger blog, right? Like, oh, okay. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, leave it there. But, um, you know what I mean? Like, um, is there a question down back? Yes. Do you ever worry about something bad happening to Steve, like a scandal? Yeah. And then you can't make fun I would stop that day. I've already thought about. No, no, I'm not joking. I would. I've already thought. I've thought a lot about that, and um, I would stop that day. I would. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't go there. I actually really like Steve Jobs. You know, I, I, I tell people I wouldn't want to work for him, and I wouldn't want to live next door to him or be related to him. But, 
but I'm really, really, really glad he's on the planet, and 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 I'm, I'm glad that other people work with him, you know, and deal with him, and you know. Um, but no, but I actually admire him. I think he's a genius, and I think that you know um, there aren't many of those people. There aren't, I don't think there's anybody who could have done what he's done at Apple in the last ten years. And I think to do what he's done, you can't just be like a you know. The, the big complaint is, oh, he's a dick, right? Basically, bottom line, one sentence is, you know, he's hard, he's difficult. And but I don't think you could. I, I, you think you could do that without being difficult? Could a nice guy do it? No, you know. So, um, no, I have huge, huge. I'm like a big Apple fan, and I love Apple products, and and I really admire him. So no, I and I have no desire to really. I mean, I like taking the piss out of him a little bit. That's you know, that's okay. But um, no, if, if anything like that happened, it would be over. Um, like, I'd write one last post, and that would be done. Uh, you know, no, I, I, you know, you know. Same, and I have another rule, which I, I'd never write about people's families or personal lives or their spouses or who they're having things with. I, 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 even in a fictional way, I mean, I'll make jokes about, okay, I don't want Ron Burkle and Clinton and, and Larry Ellison are down in Malibu and they're, you know, that was a little out of hand. And, um, <laughs> uh, they got a little carried away. And, you know, I, I have had Sergey and, you know, running around in, in a, in these, with these giant trucks full of Stanford co-eds. But that was really, that was, just, that was just me projecting, like, what I would do if I were in his shoes, you know? And, like, yeah, you know, I would have that. And, um, and I, I made up a fake uncle for Sergey. I had an uncle, Fetya, who had come over from Krasnodar. And, and, um, and I have a really good friend from Krasnodar who lives here now in, in, Berkeley, in Piedmont. I saw them yesterday, and I was telling this. And I thought, well, you know, Uncle Fetcher would be like, you know, it's kind of, I found a photo on, again, Google Images of this, you know, old Russian guy with a beard and kind of dirty and stuff. And, um, you know, his one, Sergei says, you know, you're here now, you're in America, I'm a billionaire, well, you can have anything you want. And uh, he says, well, I've always wanted to sit in a bathtub full of caviar with two hookers. So Sergei's like, you can have it, that's great, you can have it, you know. And, and, um, and then he wants, you know, he wants his own van full of hookers, and that's where he, you know, just drives around, drives up and down like the 280 with a van full of hookers. Like, I mean, that's so broad, like, I feel like that's, that's fair game. You can go there, right? That's not, but, like, yeah, I, I hate Ballywag for the, the stuff they do about people's personal lives. I, I, I don't want to go there. And I actually don't, also don't want any leaks of, like, real stuff, you know? Um, I, I met a bunch of Apple people in there, and, and I don't want to know. I, I want it to be fiction. I don't want it to be, I, you know, there's a whole bunch of sites that will do, like, what the next iPod's going to have or this and that. And they're always wrong, first of all, because I think Apple leaks some fake stuff, right, to fuck them up. <laughs> Which is, come on, I only figure that because that's what I would do, right? And, like, if I can think of it, they can think of it, right? Um, but, um, no, I, I don't want any real Apple leaks. I don't want to be a rumor site. I mean, I have some stuff once in a while that's sort of, you know, you hear something. But I really want to keep it fictional and I want to keep it away from people's home lives. And, ugh, I don't want any of that. Um, so, uh, are there any other questions or? Yes. Uh, except for Waz. Yeah. Except for Waz, yeah, with Cassie Griffin, right? But and but like Waz can take it, and he likes it. It turns out Waz loves that stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, Waz, seriously, he told me he's like he really, really loves those jokes, and he thinks they're hilarious. And did you see the one where they were dressed alike at that casino in in <laughs> Las Vegas? She hasn't dressed in a black suit with a black tie. He looks like Regis Philbin on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You know, and it's like, oh, Waz, you know, don't do this. Don't go Hollywood and try. And he's looking really uncomfortable. He has this like deer in the headlights look like. <laughs> Like, like at the Oscars, like, hey, I'm with Kathy Griffin, <laughs> you know? Like, just like, dude, just give it up, you know? And, uh, and I've been, I've been, again, I've had jokes about, like, how Waz has been married 11 times. And, you know, I don't think it's 11. I think it's from, like, 7 or something. But, um, <laughs> so, you know, you exaggerate for effect. But I think, I think he likes it. And, yeah, I wouldn't, I, you know. But I don't know anything about really Waz uh, other than the Kathy Griffin thing. And that's out in the public domain. That's in the news, so you can make fun of it. But, like, if I knew Waz had some girlfriend named... Jane or whatever, and he was, you know, I, w I would not, like, they were spotted at some restaurant last night having dinner, and they were holding hands. Like, who cares? I don't give a shit, you know? Like, I don't want that kind of stuff. Um, was there, there was another question, I think. Uh, someone have? No? Oh, yes. Are you going to be speaking at Apple Yeah, oh, yeah. The question is, am I going to be speaking at Apple anytime soon? Probably under subpoena or under oath, right? I think, uh, you know, <laughs> probably, maybe not at Apple campus, but at some law lawyer's office up in the city, I'm sure, yeah. Um, you know, no, I don't think so. Um, Although, you know, I never thought I would be at Microsoft speaking either, and, or here for that matter. So, you know, stranger things have happened. Um, I think app, I, I, I met some Apple people, and they said that they read it and they like it and, and they, they get the joke. But I think there's also, um, I don't know, maybe it could happen. I guess it wouldn't be that unheard. I think it would be hilariously funny. I mean, and, and they are tomorrow at LinkedIn. I have a talk tomorrow. He said a bunch of them are coming. Oh, the, yeah, it's LinkedIn sponsoring it. But yeah, it's. Um, the, I'm doing one tomorrow at the Computer History Museum, and um, so a bunch of Apple people are coming to that. You say, okay. Um, they, they, um, I, that, that, you know, I, I just got a call from that guy because, like, they first said they, the room would hold 300 people, right? And then 
uh, I called him today and I said, and the last I knew he said, well, we got like 100 RSVPs. And it was a while. So I called him today, he's like, what's going on? He said, dude, we have 800 RSVPs, <laughs> right? I was like, holy crap. And I called the book publisher, you better get some books down there, right? <laughs> and, um, but, and of course, the book publisher being you know, the book industry, well, we have 100 and we can't get any more for two weeks. And I go, great. Oh, shit, this is on YouTube. Um, <laughs> no. Bad news. I'm like also one of these guys, like, like oh, shit, Jesus. <laughs> Like, I always do this. I was at Kepler's on Thursday night, and I said something about my, old, my two old books are available on Amazon, and they were like, Aah! You know, like, you never say the A word in a brick-and-mortar bookstore, and then I, like, and I was really, they were really pissed. They weren't, like, fooling. and they were pissed, right? And I was like, oh, shit. Um, and then they were like, well, are the books still in print? <laughs> you know, like, and you're like, no, you know, not really. But anyway, um, but, yeah, it's, like, down here, it's crazy. Like, up in the city, I did these readings, like, 20 people would come. Like, Bike Helmet Girl came. Do you know if you know Bike Helmet Girl? The real Bike Helmet Girl came Friday night. Again, like, she was a Yelp tar that I was making fun of, like, dancing with a bike helmet on inside. And I said she must have some condition where she falls over, so she has to wear a bike helmet inside. She was, like, in her underwear, in a bike helmet with a guy on a leash. And I was like, I love this woman. I have to meet her, right? And, um... So I had this long distance, you know, this pathetic thing where Steve is in love with Bike Helmet Girl. And blah, blah. Anyway, this girl started writing to me, the real woman. And she's really cool. So she came Friday, and we went out for dinner. She came out with these Apple guys. And um, she's, like, really, really cool. And um, I had my picture taken with her and Veronica Belmont. This is so bizarre. Um, you just have to know, like, my life at home is I have two, two-year-old twins, and I'm changing diapers, right? And, like, I get to come out and hang out with Bike Helmet Girl. It's, like, really, really a gas. Um, but... Um, and again, I don't know where, how I got to that end. I don't even remember what the question was. Um, oh, um, are there any other questions? <laughs> so you can see I'm, I'm really experienced at public speaking, and I've got my stick down. Um, I'm also one of these guys that get in trouble with it. Like, I'm a reporter, right? So we always, you know, we hate PR people. Supposedly we hate PR people, and we don't like spin and blah, blah, blah. And so now I have to have a PR person. The book company has a PR person. And, like, she's my trainer, you know? And, um, and I'm, like, her nightmare client because I just say anything, right? And I get, I get on the phone with these reporters, and they're like, oh, we know the same people. You're at the Chronicle, blah, blah, blah. And then I say stuff that I shouldn't say, and it shows up in the paper. And so, yeah, I'm, like, a bad, bad client. Um, but, uh, you know, it'll, it'll all come out in the, in the end, I guess. Um, are there any other uh, questions? Or any, um, yeah? That's it? No more Google questions? I was warned that I was going to get some bad questions about Linux, but thank, I'm getting out of here before that happens. So um, thank you for coming, and um, I really appreciate it. I had fun. Thank you so much. Sir.